Hi, my name is Lorenzo, and since I can remember, I've always been fascinated by nature. I've always loved hiking, snorkeling, camping, and immersing myself in natural surroundings. However, as it's well known, now this same nature is threatened by the climate emergency. That's why throughout my life, I tried to do my part to fight its causes and its injustices. I took part in social movements, I stopped eating meat, I stopped buying clothes, I grew my hair to make people aware that I'm alternative. I reduced my usage of plastic and did all those individual actions to reduce my environmental impact. However, I traveled a lot in my life for studying, working and just enjoying. All those experiences show me the impact that climate change has around the world, especially in the poorest parts. And a big part of this acknowledgement process that I had was connected by the fact that I had the possibility to move around the globe. Many of us in the world have the possibility to move as we have these nice things called legs attached to the body. Legs attached to the body. With them, we can walk, run, jump, and move in different ways, by land, by bike, cars, buses, and trains. We can move by sea, through boats, and most incredible of all, we can fly. What our ancestors believed was something impossible can now be done. Flying enabled me to work in Kenya, in NGO. There I understood how the environmental emergency was hitting hardest the most fragile part of the population and how the high level of consumption adopted by the rich countries was the main cause of the climate emergency. Our biosphere is being sacrificed so that rich people in countries like mine can live in luxury. That's why I felt I had to go back to Europe and concentrate my energy against climate change. So bang! I took a flight and there I was, in the other part of the world, in Barcelona, starting a master in political ecology, degrowth and environmental justice to understand better how to tackle climate change. First day of my master, I met my friend Paco. I started to chit chat with him about the problems of climate change and at a certain point, during the discussion, he told me Lorenzo, man, flying is one of the worst things you can do as an individual. I haven't taken a flight in three years. I mean, I knew that for sure flying had an environmental impact, but I did not know to what degree. Maybe I just did not want to look at this because I was feeling that I was already giving up on meat, and also because whenever you look at this system you discover that everything is fucked up. And being sincerely honest, flying is really comfortable, especially for me that I've been abroad since I was 18. And yet, I'm always persecuted by a permanent and constant sense of guilt that lives on my left shoulder. And she's always there, trying to feed on something. Oh, shit! You've flown a lot in your life. How can you describe yourself as an environmentalist? Come on, look into it. Maybe it's not that bad. I hope that Paco was just exaggerating. I mean, the guy lives on a boat and has not bought clothes since the Stone Age. However, I got curious and I started to ask some questions to people that know more about the topic. And this is what I found. Well, aviation is one of the most polluting modes of transport, uh, or the most polluting uh, way you can actually move around. Aviation uh, represents approximately 2.5% of global emissions in 2018. Now, you think that that's a small number, but actually, if it was a country, it would be the sixth largest emitter of CO2 emissions globally. So just after Japan and just before Germany. So it's approximately 1 billion tons of CO2 per year. I mean, we are talking today about more emission than the entire country of Germany. That's 80 million people that emit less than the aviation sector. But let's look at the individual level. Having a vegetarian diet reduces your CO2 by 460 kilograms per year. Well, if you take a flight to go and back from Rome to Berlin, you're personally responsible for 700 kilograms of CO2. All the reduction that I can achieve from being vegetarian is cancelled by taking only one flight trip. 
it's not just CO2, it's non-CO2. And if you consider both of them, flying is actually more like 6% of total human-induced global warming. So, for example, when you burn fossil fuel, you have what we call nitrogen oxide, so NOx. The issue is that these emissions actually have also a climate warming impact. At a specific level in the atmosphere, when you release NOx and particulate matter, they form these white stripes that you see coming out of airplanes. They, these are called contrails. And at specific levels, specific weather conditions, these can transform into clouds that trap the heat irradiating from the Earth. So they also contribute to climate change. 6% it is like more emission than Russia. That's 144 million people that emit less than the aviation industry, making aviation the fourth largest emitter of the world. Okay, but why are we calculating the aviation pollution as if it was a state? I guess states include aviation emissions in their climate budget, right? One of the issues that we face today on an international level is that a number of the states don't include all aviation emissions in their climate target. And that's the most effective way to force governments to start regulating emissions. No country takes into account the emissions of their flights. Those emissions are calculated according to the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO. And all the aviation industry is responsible for it. The thing is not just that aviation is very polluting, but it's also that it's very unequal. So very few people in the world are flying actually every year and most people are not flying. Estimations say that about 80% or more of the global population have never even set foot on a plane, while it's 1% of people that cause 50% of aviation pollution. Beside being a really unequal industry, the main risk that the aviation poses to climate change comes from its growth trend. They want to keep on growing. And uh, projections before COVID were that um, the industry could triple until 2050. And because of no technical solutions ready for tackling emissions uh, and still growing, that would mean that also emissions would almost triple until then. Aviation is heading up the way and we're on track to be go from sort of 3% to 25% by 2050. So it's going to become a lot more difficult to make this argument that we're only a small piece of the problem and people can look elsewhere for their emission savings. Oh shit! So here you are advocating against climate change, but at the same time you're doing the worst thing you can do towards the planet. Flying! Rather than a solution you look like a part of the problem. Oh fuck! What are we going to do? After hearing this first answer, I wanted to deepen my understanding on how aviation endangers the environment and communities. Was it just emissions? Or was there, was there, was there something more? So I started to look at the city that I'm living in, Barcelona. And I found out that there was a plan to expand the airport. I wanted to know how this project would endanger the local and global environment. So I went to a protest against the airport expansion. During the protest, I met some activist and again asked it some question. Lo que quieren hacer es primero ampliar la tercera pista eh, hacia la Laguna de la Ricarda, luego crear una ciudad aeroportuaria en unos terrenos que ya están urbanizados. Después eh, hacer una terminal satélite, es decir, hacer una terminal nueva. Y quieren alargarla 500 metros. ¿Qué pasa? Que justo cuando termina la tercera pista empieza una reserva. Este es un espacio protegido por la máxima figura de la Unión Europea y aquí hay un montón de hábitats. Que si cogemos un metro cuadrado de este espacio de la Ricarda tendríamos una diversidad de especies similar a una selva tropical. Para all in all, what the aviation wanted to achieve? El objetivo es incrementar la capacidad de vuelos de este aeropuerto. Why are you complaining? This project should be good for the economy. I mean, this brings 1,700 millions of investments and more tourists in this city. They for more jobs. No. Incluso, aunque no se toque la Ricarda, cualquier ampliación del aeropuerto tiene impactos. Uno a nivel de clima. Estamos emitiendo una gran cantidad de CO2 con efectos en el cambio climático. 
la ampliación prevista para llegar a 70 millones de pasajeros en el aeropuerto del Prat, que es lo que quiere AENA, supondría un crecimiento del 33% de las emisiones. Estamos hablando de una situación de emergencia climática y hay un compromiso de las instituciones. Concretamente, el compromiso para Cataluña es reducir las emisiones un 7,6% cada año. Por lo tanto, ampliar la aviación es incompatible con estos objetivos. Estamos ante una movilidad de personas. Van a traer a 15 millones de personas más a estarse unos días de vacaciones en Cataluña. Esto también implica más turismo, más gentrificación y al final la ciudad esto va a parecer como un poco como Venecia, como un museo donde no viva nadie y donde está hiper mega contaminado. Nosotros queremos que es el momento de decrecer, de decrecer tanto en la aviación como también en, en el turismo que está llegando a la ciudad, que es insostenible. Was this was just happening in Barcelona? Despite COVID, there's still a lot of airports around the world that are expanded or even new airports being built, especially in global south countries. And um, what we see in almost every case is that human rights are violated, people are displaced where airports are being built. For example, this is what happened in Cameroon. Riot scenes near Cameroon's Douala's International Airport on Saturday. The police here are having a hard time trying to disperse a group of young people who are protesting the demolition of their mosque. They say we're going to fix the airport, hence the breakage. But they come to demolish everything. Oh shit, you're a hypocrite. Do you remember when you flew from Nairobi to Lamu for vacation? Yes, T-Rex, it was a great vacation. What do you want now? Lamu County Governor Issa Timami, however, assured the residents that none of them will be evicted, even as the county government plans to come up with fresh plans of allocating land to residents who will be affected by the acquisition of land to allow for the expansion of the airport. No oh, shit. Look at you, you shitty hypocrite. Why, savior? You're going to Africa to help. Then you're using an airport that could displace people. You're just a piece of shit. You're a fucking fraud. You're a so a lot of emission, inequality, environmental injustice, sound pollution, destruction of habitats, and gentrification. Okay, my sense of guilt has reached a limit. Let's stop taking flights, so that T-Rex cannot feed anymore. Hence, I decided to stop taking flights for a year, and I start to travel by bus and trains. Worst of all is that after 11 months, I stopped taking flights, I knew I had to take one. My older brother was getting married and I had to take a long flight again to go to his wedding in Kenya. However, now I wanted to reduce my impact as much as I could and my island said that I could offset my personal emission. Is this the solution? That could be amazing. I could make T-Rex starve and finally leave me alone so that I could sleep without this annoying creature on my shoulder. Offsetting is something that you could actually call green indulgences. So buying yourself a good conscience when it comes to the industry, they say you give us a bit more money for your tickets and so we will reduce emissions elsewhere. If you cost one ton of emissions with your flight, give us that amount of money. We will plant trees in Ghana or in Costa Rica. It's like if you decide to go on a diet or if I decide to go on a diet, but I pay someone else to go to the gym for me. And there's no proof that this person is actually going to go to the gym. And I can just continue eating fast food, eating uh, junk food, and not dealing with reducing my own weight. And that's the whole concept of offsetting, and that's why it doesn't work. With this kind of forest carbon offset projects, it's temporarily. So, I mean, a tree will die. It can burn, if there can be a pest affecting the forest, it can just die because, you know, it's old and trees die. And then when that happens, carbon is released back to the atmosphere. So you are not actually really even compensating the, the emissions that you've caused because that will be released at some point. And that's exactly what's happened this year with some offsets that BP and Microsoft bought in America. The, the entire forest burned down and the offsets went up in smoke. It's not that they plant indigenous trees that will benefit a community on the ground. Many times it actually involves like monoculture tree plantations of exotic trees that end up having lots of impacts on both environment and the communities around those projects. Most typically these plantations are made of pine 
or eucalyptus because they are fast growing species and they are really, you know, you can make profits out of them really quickly. There is no biodiversity associated uh, to them. They are just empty. They dry up uh, water resources, leaving many times the communities without water. Offsets are neocolonial because instead of reduce here in the source or instead of stop taking airplanes or stopping consuming so much energy here, the industrialized countries are using territories in other parts of the world and mainly in our territories, in Ecuador, in America Latina, in Africa and Asia. Why you don't make plantations here? So this is completely racist because this is black people, indigenous people, so we are going to use their lands. <laughs> you fucking idiot! You thought that offset could starve me? Come on, give it a try. Let's see if it does. <laughs> okay, I won't buy any offsets. However, it sounds that the aviation was using offsetting as a main solution for fixing their environmental damages. From today, we are offsetting all the carbon emissions from our flights. Was this the only way? that the aviation industry was aiming to make itself sustainable. Then, one day, on the internet, I saw an article saying that Boris Johnson was flying to the COP26 on Green Fool. And I thought, Green Fool? What the fuck? How does that relate to the COP? Is this a real thing or just another carbon offset COP-out scheme? So I started to wonder, what are green fuels? And what are the other solutions that the aviation sector and governments want to adopt to reduce the climate impact of the aviation sector? Then an idea flashed into my mind. What a better place than COP26 in Glasgow for discovering it. Maybe you were wondering, what is COP? So the COP is the Convention on Climate Change, which meets every year in the Conference of the Party since 1992. The majority of leaders of the world come at COP to discuss and contribute for reducing the CO2 emissions. COP26 is the meeting which will happen this year in Glasgow. Pack my bags and BAM! I took a bus to Paris, then another one to Brussels. Here I joined Rail to the COP, a train of activists fighting against climate change that brought me to Glasgow. Okay, let's do one step back. I mean, this time it was definitely not BAM. First, wake up at 5 am, taking a 15 hours bus ride to Paris. Then, I stayed at Anna's place, mm -hmm. a friend of mine, for some days. Then, another bus of 5 hours to Brussels. And besides not being definitely banged, I noticed something. Since I stopped flying one year ago, I was paying more, but way more. Yes, you can do that because you are a white snowflake, son of a good woman. Ciao, mama. Privileged hipster who can act as an environmentalist. In the last year, I was comparing prices of trains, buses, and airplanes. Flying is always the cheapest option in Europe, followed by buses and finally trains. It looked like the more you polluted, the less you paid. Even if the more environmental and fastest way to move is using a train, I was not able to take it from Barcelona to Brussels because it was too expensive. To go to Glasgow, I spent 30 euros for the bus from Barcelona to Paris, then 15 from Paris to Brussels, and 70 to get from Brussels to Glasgow by train. I spent a total of 115 euros and 26 hours without counting layovers. A flight would have cost me three hours and 20 euros. But why? Why flying so cheap? Why traveling slower? with using less energy costs more than taking a huge plane that uses a lot of energy, it uses a lot of fuel, it doesn't make any sense. So it means like, if you want to be greener, you have to be richer and put yourself in an uncomfortable position. This year I hated myself knowing that I was spending 43 or 70 euros where I could take a plane for 12 euros from Barcelona to Milan and be there in one hour and a half. Instead I was there for 15 hours on the bus. Uh, uh, in a super uncomfortable position, it doesn't make any sense. Why it works like that? Please tell me why. I don't understand it. Fuck. Okay, yeah. Airlines are enjoying huge tax privileges and the whole aviation industry has huge tax privileges. So when you fly and you see your ticket price 
um, there's almost no taxes included in that. One of the main reasons why it's so cheap to fly today is because the aviation sector receives so many subsidies and is exempt from so many taxes. And governments have made the choice over the past decades to fund that sector um, to, be, to enable you and me to fly for the price of a cup of coffee. One of the main tax exemptions that is an issue for the aviation sector is the jet fuel tax. Airlines don't pay a single cent on the fuel that they put in their tanks. Whereas we pay tax for, to heat our homes, we pay tax to run our cars, but airlines don't pay a single cent on their fuel. Another tax exemption is VAT. You pay VAT on you know, restaurants, bars, anything that you consume, you pay VAT, but you don't pay VAT on most of your flight tickets. And then apart from that, you also have a lot of subsidies. So you know, governments invest in airlines, they finance infrastructure projects, they finance airport expansions. Exploit their workers, so many airlines pay very, very little money first bump in what could be a turbulent summer for Ryanair, as Irish pilots go on strike Thursday for better working conditions. And of course, airlines do not account for uh, the hidden costs of ecological destruction they cause. There's a lot of money that is given to the sector that can enable them to produce those cheap prices. It's very unfair how much you pay for a train ticket and how much you pay for a plane ticket, considering how much environmental impact that causes. So for those airlines that are not um, state-owned or don't have the state participation, they get subsidies indirectly from governments investing in the infrastructure that they use. So for example, France will invest in Toulouse Airport and finance an infrastructure project, and then Toulouse Airport will then lower the airport charges that it's making, pay, making airlines pay for. And so airlines indirectly benefit from the subsidies that is given to those airports to reduce then the price of the ticket. Who pays you know, for these flights in the end? It's taxpayers. It's governments using your tax money to fund cheap tickets elsewhere. So we have to stop believing that having a cheap ticket doesn't have a cost somewhere else in the world. Okay, I get it. Flying is super bad for the environment, for social justice and for humans. But still, it is super cheap. I mean, of course people will continue flying. Something needs to be done at the government level. Finally, I was heading to Glasgow from Brussels for the COP26, this time with a train organized by activists, Rail to the COP. There I met Todd, an ex-pilot of airplanes, and Finlay, an ex-engineer who used to design plane engines. They gave a workshop on the problems of aviation and what the industry claims are going to be the solutions. Finally, with this workshop and with the previous interviews, I could have a full picture of the solution that the aviation and governments were pursuing. The first thing the industry talks about is just making the aircraft en engines and the aircraft themselves more efficient. So if you've got like, an aircraft with 200 passengers flying from London to New York, right now maybe we, we've improved the efficiency by about 10% compared to 10 or 15 years ago. So we burn 10% less fuel, 10% less emissions, and they say that's really good, we've saved carbon. But the reality is we've made these aircraft 10% more efficient, but there's twice as many. So we still increased emissions by 80, 90%. And the second thing is they say, well, um, how about we use batteries? The problem is, is weight. So batteries and electrical systems like motors, generators, and the power systems, they're super heavy. And one kilogram of jet fuel has as much energy as 50 kilograms of batteries, pretty much. So it makes it almost impossible to take, if you just a conventional aircraft, replace the jet fuel with batteries, you, so with battery electric, we're only going to see these small, short-range aircraft. If you're flying two hours with five people, you could probably do that journey on a train or on a bus. The next thing is hydrogen, because hydrogen is good on weight. There's three times more energy in a kilogram of hydrogen than in jet fuel. It looks great. The problem is volume, so you need these massive storage containers. So this means if you design a hydrogen aircraft, you need like a massive aircraft to have extra space for the tanks or you need to start getting rid of passengers. So then you say, okay, hydrogen batteries, that isn't gonna work. How about alternative fuels like biofuels or electrofuels, e-fuels? Just to say biofuels and electrofuels are like jet fuel, they're like kerosene, but they're just manufactured in a different way. So rather than taking fossil fuels from underground, that's carbon that's stored over thousands of years, 
bringing it up and burning it and adding additional carbon to the atmosphere. What we're doing is we're recycling carbon that's already here, like in our trees, in our biomass, or we're sucking carbon out of the air industrially and using um, that carbon. And what you do is you combine that carbon with hydrogen and you get a hydrocarbon fuel and it's equivalent to jet fuel. Now the good thing about this is you can use it in existing aircraft, existing airports, they're already ready to go. The problem is it really just cannot be scaled. So look at current jet fuel consumption. We can basically produce maybe two, 5% with biofuels, um, but we can't scale it up. Otherwise we're just gonna rely on energy crops that we, you know, land that we need to be growing food, we'll be growing biofuel on. And we're already doing this um, for road transport and it's been an absolute disaster in terms of biodiversity, deforestation, land conflicts, land grabs, um, particularly around the equator. So yeah, so then there's electrofuel. So this is making jet fuel from electricity. The problem is, if we turned all of our jet fuel use just now into electrofuel, we need three to four times the existing renewable en energy capacity of the entire world. I think technology plays a big role, but we need to be aware that the level of flying that we have today is not going to be compatible with the amount of technologies that can solve the problem. All we're seeing is just complete and utter greenwash. Really all they're doing right now is, is using clever marketing tactics and uh, the only way we can reduce emissions in the sector right now is by flying less. Once I arrived to Glasgow, I was well aware that the solution proposed by the aviation were not working. Just now, after the COVID crisis, the industry wants to recreate demand volume. Therefore, they are proposing insanely cheap fares at their expenses so that people restart to fly. Meanwhile, other companies, for not losing their lots in the airports, have sent 100,000 flights completely empty. According to Greenpeace, these generate up to 2.1 million tons of greenhouse gas emission, or as much as 1.4 million average petrol or diesel cars emitting a year. And worst of all, nobody from the aviation sector or at the government level was mentioning that flying less could help the environment. I, I'm going to have to put this to you. What, what about reducing flying? What about flying less? You, your, your presentation was saying, you know, we can do this and achieve this and we can actually increase the number of people who get into planes and grow, grow the sector. Um, Campaigners and Sarah Andrew have made the case that uh, actually, you know, we don't have the time to, to do this and the, the solution is to fly less and particularly fly less short haul. So what's your response to that? Uh, many, many responses to that. First of all, the issue is, is it, 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 it is complicated, but you see it is, a, it is the wrong focus. It is the wrong focus. It made me realize that the solution posed by the aviation industry were just blah, blah, blah. But what actually is at stake for aviation at this conference? So member states need to include aviation emissions, all aviation emissions, within their climate targets. And that's something that at COP26 we're hoping member states are going to support. This is bullshit. Okay, so the only thing that is on the table is just including the CO2 emission inside state budget. It is a good proposal, but far from enough. During my journey for creating this documentary, I met many activists that aimed at making the aviation responsible for their environmental impact. So I joined them in protests and in doing some actions. Today I uh, went to the protest of Extinction Rebellion against greenwashing. Anyway, all the politicians tomorrow are gonna fly back with their nice planes and uh, it looks like uh, they haven't understand shit and that things are still going as usual. Yesterday Boris Johnson uh, left uh, the COP uh, with a, a jet 
for doing the distance from Glasgow to London, a four uh, hours train uh, journey. He took a jet for doing that. Uh, coming back from a climate uh, summit. During my time in Glasgow, I experienced a roller coaster of emotion. I was happy to see this tsunami of people which understood that the biggest problem of climate change are due to capitalism and its addiction to perpetual growth. And this gave me a lot of hope. However, other days, I was down thinking for how many years people have been marching and for how many years the mission have kept rising. It was something which was not working in the system of the COP. I don't have much faith in the COP process. For me, all I see is that it's completely rigged. It's just an opportunity for global neo-colonial uh, leaders to, to greenwash their, their activities. They don't represent the voices of the people. It's, it's rigged to fail, in my opinion, and we need to continue to keep building the activist movement. Uh, we need this, this grassroots uh, swell to continue. Like, I was actually a little bit despondent at the beginning of COP, but as the week's gone on, I've seen Fridays for Future, all, all of these young people, just so powerful and inspirational, speaking to activists that have managed to come here and they're representing the voices of either their indigenous communities or, or their communities in poorer nations that are on the front lines right now. They give me hope. And also the Global Climate Justice March, there was 100,000 people at least out on the streets. But it's not just about marching, you know, the marching's been done for 30 years, the petitions have been done. We need non-violent direct action. The Glasgow conference did not bring any new restriction for the aviation industry. The UK's proposal of inserting CO2 emission in country carbon budgets did not even pass. It looked like protesting at Glasgow was for nothing. However, in the last 10 years, the dialogue inside the aviation has started to shift. We have this ridiculous environmental taxation system in Europe of ETS, which exempts all the long haul carriers who account for 56% of European aviation CO2 emissions. Mm. So we exempt the most polluting uh, airlines but we then transferred the entire burden of taxation on the most efficient, which is the low-cost carriers with new technology aircraft, who carry only European citizens. In, in so we exempt the Chinese, the Americans, yeah. and the Asians, and then we double tax European citizens. So how do we tax the Chinese, the, the, the Asians, and the I Americans? I think it has to be at the point of, you know, it has to be a fuel tax. or Fuel tax. Fuel tax or this is breaking news, isn't it? Ryanair approves a tax, isn't that... But still, there is a lot of work to do. We intend to Sorry. lead on carbon, re on, uh, carbon reduction, CO2 emissions, non-CO2 emissions, you name it, we're going to reduce it. As well as the price of air travel across Europe for the next five or ten years, because I've got to grow to 225 million passengers a year between now and 2050. Yes, they are greenwashing, because right now, this is the situation. From the head of the United Nations, as it released a new and urgent climate report. It suggests the world is running out of time. The co-chair of the report insists it's now or never. They talk the talk and then there's zero commitment, zero policy, zero law to enforce countries and corporations to, to do what's required. The premise of this COP26 is, is built around uh, a 1.5 degree limit 
We're already at 1.2 degrees. We've seen a climate-induced famine in Madagascar. Uh, we're looking at 1.2 billion climate refugees by 2050. <music> 38 degrees in the Arctic Circle, the melting of the Arctic ice, the, uh, the tipping point of the Amazon rainforest, I could go on and on. All these things are happening now at 1.2 degrees. And the reality is 1.5 degrees, according to Chatham House, there's a less than 1% chance of reaching that. All of the IPCC pathways show that we're gonna overshoot. The UN roadmap to avoid disaster says we must stop increasing greenhouse gas emissions by 2025, then swiftly cut them 43% by the end of the decade. They're framing it as if it's still on the table, but it's not. You know, 1.5 degrees, it's not going to happen. And reality is, you know, Chatham House are saying there's even a 10% chance that we could hit seven degrees by the end of a century. Now, if, if I welcomed you on board the flight and said, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, you know, we're, we're flying off to Malaga today. By the way, there's a, a one in 10 chance of us reaching our destination safely today. In fact, we could all be killed. Great, Lorenzo, putting a drastic interview to show how fucked up the situation is, you little prick! After 10 days of protests in Glasgow, I understood it was time to go back. On my way back, I passed through Paris where I met Anna, my friend. So Anna, I want to go back to Milano for, for Christmas, I want to see my mamma. I want to see my mamma, 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 mamma. <laughs> so I, how, how can I go back? Okay, your options are either you take the bus, that would mean that you would have to spend 140 euros on a Flix bus, that would take like 13 hours or 15 hours, or you could take a train from Barcelona, that would mean that you have to take either three trains or two trains, and it's like always more than 10 hours to go there, and it's 292 euros. Wow. It's pretty crazy. But there is another option that you can... Uh... And so? <laughs> and so it's like a Ryanair, 33 euros. And I mean, it's pretty quick with the plane, you know, like... Uh... So going and going back, 33 euros. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. Nice, <laughs> yes. So uh, what, what I should do, Anna? I think you should take the plane. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a lot cheaper in the end. So... It is a lot cheaper. Yeah, makes sense. Should have some sense of guilt, you know? Yeah, I think, yes, everyone should. But, uh, but in the end, what can you do? What can you do? Yeah, what could I do? Okay, viewers, so I hope you understand that the aviation industry is bad. However, flying is easier. It is literally quite bang. You pay little and bang, you're in the other part of the world. But, and it is a big but, it destroys the environment, it is not good for local communities. The solution posed by the industry are quite a joke, and their plan to grow their business means that their pollution will grow too. So, what can you do as an individual? First of all, you can try to not fly. Try always to choose a way of transport that impacts the environment less. Ask yourself if that flight is really necessary. Do I really have to go there? Or can I just spend my vacation in a place that is closer? However, it looks like it is very difficult to find an alternative, but in the end you can find them. For example, I found a blah blah car to go back to Italy. It cost me 45 euros and I had a super cool journey with cool people and with the most beautiful dog in the world. At the same time, it's more beautiful. During my journeys to Glasgow, I saw many amazing cities and landscapes. I met friends and new amazing people, making the journey even cooler. So just not flying is not an easy decision for everyone. So if you decide for yourself that you don't want to fly, I think the best is um, to do it together with others and to join a movement in, in, in some way. You can try to join or support a movement like Stay Grounded. Stay Grounded is a global network of 170 member organizations. We have trade unions, climate justice groups, NGOs, the local anti-airport groups who are all struggling and fighting for a reduction of aviation and alternative mobility systems. You can check their website and all the associations that they work with and see if you can join one close to your area or work directly with them. Or if you see that there is a plan to expand the airport close where you live, you can try to join or initiate a movement against it. Or just give them money to continue their work. Bing, 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 bing. However, I believe that we cannot put all the pressure on the individual. If you live on another continent, 
you should have the right to fly back and see your family. Also, if you're in Europe and you don't have a lot of money and you really have to go, do it. What are you saying? If it was not for the blah blah car, I would probably have taken a flight. What? Yes, I admit it. I wouldn't spend all that money for a bus or a train because I don't have it and I wanted to say hi to my mamma. My mamma. Therefore, I believe pressure should be put on governments. The main way to make the aviation sector responsible for their em emissions is to regulate them because the industry is not going to clean itself up by itself. The reason why aviation is not doing it is because we're not regulating them. So fundamentally, as a citizen, you should be encouraged to pressure your own government to deal with aviation emissions um, instead of continuing to rely on the industry to clean up itself. The most environmental thing you can do as an individual is try to change the system. Because it is the system that makes you fly for the price of a cup of coffee. It is the system that is based on the fairy tale of growth. It is the system that cares more about profits rather than community, life and earth. And for changing the system, protesting works. It works because some years ago, nobody was talking about aviation pollution. And now, government, people and industry do so. Now, the job is to expose the greenwash solution that the industries portray and make pressure to government to limit aviation growth. A T-Rex, which talks all the time and gains control of your life, is the result of a marketing strategy that aims to put the burden of the environmental damages on you so that they are not responsible for it. What do you mean? I can talk as much as I want, you shitty privileged white man who complains about how to move around. You do documentary in aviation and then you take buses, do you know they pollute too? You're a fucking fraud. You are a joke. You... You what, huh? You're a fucking joke, you <laughs> Ah, oh, yes, really? I am? Huh? Who is in there? Oh, please, now give me my arm back, please. T-Rex is good, but only to a certain level. Don't make this little bastard the protagonist of your life because it's going to destroy you. Are you going to behave now? Yes, I will. I will behave. I'm gonna be good. So, what policies could be adopted to restrain aviation? The industry needs to pay a fair share of taxes. That's very important. At the same time, um, it's very clear that some flights, especially short-haul flights, um, domestic flights in many countries are totally unnecessary, so they just should be banned. There are also different segments of the aviation industry that could be taxed more. Private jets, for example. You know, we know it's an actual growing problem. The emissions from the sector are growing much faster than commercial aviation. Uh, in France, for example, I think in 2019, one flight out of 10 was actually a private jet. We can just stop expanding airports, constrain the capacity of airports and that will constrain demand because there's only so many takeoff slots in a day. And through protesting, my friend in Barcelona were able to stop the airport expansion. In los últimos días, el govern ha cambiado su posición. Incluso hemos conocido que miembros del govern de la Generalitat puede que asistan a la manifestación del día 19 en contra de este proyecto. Make sure that airlines pay the right price for their emissions. We think that a carbon price of around 160 euros by 2030 would be effective and then reaching 360 in 2050. So we need a higher carbon price because that's also why or how those solutions that are today too expensive are going to become competitive. You could use a frequent flyer levy where, where the tax that goes up with the more they fly or the more jet fuel they use the higher the tax is. So like an income tax works, right? Like not everybody pays the same income tax. Above a certain threshold, you then get a higher rate of tax than again. And we could do a similar thing with jet fuel. This tax would be just as it would keep flights cheaper for people who really need to fly. And frequent flyer would drop as they could not afford anymore to fly. And for the reason that 1% of flyers produce 50% of total aviation emissions, this would make the CO2 drop drastically. But also another important thing is reimagining completely how we move. This documentary took only one train. Europe has an amazing train system, but it's not as easy to book a ticket internationally as it is to book a flight. And the worst of all, it costs more. The train is the best option as it pollutes less. It is comfortable, fast, and you arrive directly in the city center. How about giving more incentives to train and bringing back night trains? 
For example, here in Barcelona there was a night train to Milano. They cancelled it in 2013. I want it back. And because my thesis supervisor told me to do also a finale for the intellectual audience, here a monologue of another white man on its ivory tower. Aviation is a perfect study case that shows how capitalism, in connection with perpetual growth, cannot work for the planet, neither for its inhabitants. Our society works in a way in which people from the north of the world can accumulate always more and have many material stuff, while people from the south of the world suffer from this accumulation of environmental and social injustice. Aviation works like this. We have a rich minority of the population that enjoy the benefits of flying, while the biggest majority that has never flew is subjected to its negative outputs. And if the situation continues like this, the damages will become bigger and bigger. How can we imagine to take care of the earth and its inhabitants if we still want to grow our business by using resources and fossil fuels on a finite planet? Someone will answer you that technology can solve all our problems, that COP26 will solve our problems. However, where is this technology? Where are the policies needed? How can we think that the politicians that have a finite term and are completely absorbed mentally on this fairy tale of perpetual growth will do something about it. And if they do so, do we have still time to wait for their magical solution? So long story short, what is needed is to fly less. As an individual, use flying as the last alternative, and really if you have to. Look at your T-Rex for suggestion, but don't make him the protagonist of your life. Individual change is needed to create systemic change, because the same individuals together can put pressure to governments through protesting, lobbying, sign petition, boycotting, vote against subsidy to the aviation industry and its growth. But always remember, try to hug your mama without taking a plane. Mama! Mama! Mami! Shit, I forgot about COVID. He's a white, white, white.